There is a wake-up call here, and there is a lesson to be learned. There is a reality that has existed for a long time that we have been blind to, and that is climate change, extreme weather, call it what you will, and our vulnerability to it. It is undeniable today. For years, scientists have been saying that a warming planet, rising seas, would bring more extreme storms. Is Superstorm Sandy proof of what they've been predicting? We don't have radio communications. How many people answer that question seems to have more to do with politics than science. It's true. Sandy was a freak storm, a bad luck confluence of a number of low probability events that could conceivably have happened in some alternate climate that wasn't warming. But this climate, our climate, is warming. And as it does, low probability events like this will become more probable and more intense. I work at MSNBC, a cable news channel whose core audience is made up of liberals. And I see all the time how deep the divide is between the left and right when it comes to climate change, even here in New York. Across the river from Manhattan, where I work, is Staten Island. It's New York's most conservative borough and the hardest hit by Sandy. The storm killed 23 people here, more than anywhere else in the city. Let's see if the, the best Western in Bay Ridge has already signed up to accept FEMA. If they haven't, let's get that done. I got someone going to Home Depot now to get as much stuff as we can. Staten Island's congressman, Republican Michael Grimm, is a former Marine who served in the Gulf War. But he says this devastation is unlike anything he's ever seen. We will help you, absolutely. That's. That's what, that's what we do. This is what we do. Grimm is also a skeptic when it comes to climate change. And every time we have a flood, it's worse and worse. Last year, we had a flood three feet of water. This time, well, we have 11 feet of water. And then what's going to happen next time? 20 feet of water? But is it possible this storm could change his mind? I'm a biologist by training. I've spent my life studying the natural world. But lately, I've had to start focusing more on human nature rather than mother nature. That's because people are having an unprecedented impact on the planet. And everyone wants to ask me about it. From evening news anchors. CBS News science and environmental contributor M. Sanjan is here to tell us more about the mega fire phenomenon to late night talk show hosts. We have been living on a changing planet for a long, long time. This change is just gonna happen fast. After Superstorm Sandy, lots of people are wondering if human activity is making the weather more extreme. And I'm on my way to meet a scientist who studies just that. Her laboratory is an island in the middle of nowhere. More specifically, it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean near the equator, where some of the planet's most extreme weather is born. Every few years, an unusual band of warm water spreads across this part of the ocean and disrupts weather patterns around the world. The phenomenon is called El Nino, and it's linked to severe droughts, flooding, storms, and fire. The death toll is still rising tonight from the latest bi-coastal double shot of El Nino-driven storms. In the worst El Ninos, ocean temperatures can rise a startling 14 degrees above average. And partly because warm water expands, sea level can increase by as much as a foot. El Ninos are natural. The question is, could man-made climate change be making them more severe?
unprecedented ways. That the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed. The amounts of snow and ice have diminished. Sea level has risen and the concentrations of greenhouse gases are... There is no more fire season. We have wildfires all year round. Climate change, extreme weather, pull up with will, and our vulnerability to years of drought has left the landscape bone dry. We got any patriots in the ground! A new scientific report has determined the last decade was the warmest on record. Our world is changing faster and more dramatically than ever before. It is five o'clock and the timing of landfall of this storm could be just an hour away. We've already been feeling the effects of Hurricane Sandy for hours now. And the tide is up above the pier, which is scaring the shit out of me. If you want to get off the island, uh, you're not going to take the ferries. This has been shut down. On the night of Hurricane Sandy, Patricia Dresch her husband, George, and their 13-year-old daughter, Angela, decided to stay inside and ride out the storm. Then the wind started picking up that afternoon, and trees started falling. This one tree from across the street just like peeled like a banana. And my neighbors took a picture of George that afternoon in front of this tree. Angela was with one of my neighbors, and they were on the beach, and she was taking pictures. And that was it. And then we had dinner. After dinner, I looked out my front door, and I saw the big waves coming. Then I went in my dining room, and the floor was starting to lift up. What went through your mind when you saw that? That we had to go up. When we got upstairs, we went in the closet. And we had to get out of the closet because the water was coming through the wall. And it's on the second floor? Yes. So there was water high enough that mm -hmm. it was coming through the wall? George said, oh, the house next door is gone. I said, what do you mean the house next door is gone? He said, yeah, the house is gone. 911, we have emergency. Yeah, 687 Yetman Avenue in Staten Island. My sister is stuck in the house. She has total water around her. She can't get out the door. But they have a young kid, but they have a 13-year-old with them also. And what's your sister's name? Patricia Dresch. We went to the bathroom. And then when we went into the bathroom, I held on to the faucet. What is Angela saying at that point? What's what She's George scared. saying? She said, Mommy, hold me. I'm scared. And I did. I held her, and I had her in front of me. And then a wave started coming up over me. I felt the water rising. And then all of a sudden, my stall shower came apart. And then the whole wall broke loose. And we went out into the yard. When I got thrown out of the wall, something slid off the roof, hit us in the head, and we went under. And I knew I lost her immediately because I knew she couldn't get up again. It was just too deep for her. I went down, way down deep. And as I was getting unconscious, floating down, I said, I'm not going to die like this. I can't die like this. They're not going to find me like this. And I got myself back up, and I grabbed the phone cables. That's how high up I was. We have a patient with us. All right, so repeat, uh, what's the condition of the patient? She was pulled out. She had hypothermia. I still can't believe she's gone, and he's gone. You know, I don't know. It's very hard. Life was cut too short. I'll never see her get married. I'll never see her grow up. I don't want to go see her in a grave. She doesn't deserve, he doesn't deserve to be there. I don't want to see them in a grave. See where that storm surge basically pushed right across the beach, right through these neighborhoods, and has basically inundated these uh, streets. We'll count them off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Again, close to 12 blocks inland. So again, that's a pretty far distance here. In the U.S., Superstorm Sandy left over 100 people dead. 
most of them drowned in the record storm surge. Here on Staten Island, some people face down a wall of water 16 feet high. After the storm, Pat Tresh spent a week in the hospital. Now that she's out, she has to bury her husband, George, and daughter, Angela. The loss is felt by the whole community. This was the perfect storm. High tide, full moon, everything came together and converged in a way that, and it happened, you know, I heard story after story, and I said to people, why didn't you leave? They said, Congressman, everything was fine. It was a little windy, a little rain. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I see water coming down the block like a movie. I grabbed my kids and ran as if Godzilla was coming. That type of thing, like all of a sudden, there's the monster. When did you first hear about Pat Trash and her, her family? Later that day. Um, I don't choke up easily. My eyes were welled up because all she kept saying to me, begging me, find my husband. Because at that point, they had recovered her daughter's body, but not her husband's. I don't think ever trained to see your friends and neighbors in total despair, hopelessness. And it just hit me harder. One of the things that was interesting, the governor said this was a wake-up call about climate, specifically, when, after this happened. And I'm curious just what your reaction is to that. The climate overall has changed. But let's leave out the part of whether it's man-made or not, because I don't think the science is there to tell us what's causing it. Mm -hmm. I think Mother Earth evolves, and patterns change every so many hundred years or thousand years, and we're in part of a process of changing. But I don't want to get into the political debate of what's causing it. At first, Grimm's answer doesn't surprise me. I'm used to politicians, especially Republicans, dodging questions about climate change. But the more I think about it, the more ridiculous it seems. Superstorm Sandy just destroyed part of his district. Doesn't Michael Grimm want to get to the bottom of what caused it? Christmas Island is one of the most beautiful places I have ever been to. But there's something else that's brought me here, besides the beaches. This remote place may hold the key to one of the world's most dangerous climate phenomena, El Nino. I've traveled thousands of miles to come here to meet a renowned climate scientist who's studying it, Georgia Tech professor, Dr. Kim Cobb. Kim, good to see you. Thanks for having us, Zach. Yeah. It's a whole science village here. Well, yeah, we're turning into that. Yeah, we have gear scattered around the entire place, so... Um... To be honest, I didn't expect literally thatch roof huts. <laughs> I mean, this is like, Kim uh, tells me she started out studying medicine, but the more she learned about climate change, the more convinced she was that what was happening to our planet is a bigger threat than any disease. And for the past 17 years, she's been studying how climate change is affecting yeah, El Nino. Right. El Nino is a natural climate phenomenon. It's, it's born in the tropical Pacific. It's born where we're sitting right now. And it's a change in water temperature that's very dramatic. And it lasts for about six months or so. And what that does is it reorganizes the entire global atmospheric circulation sure. during that time period. And so... Droughts in some places. Droughts in some places. Mudslides in others. Massive floods in others. When El Nino happens, the largest signal happens along the equator because of an ocean circulation that typically brings cooler waters to the equator as a function of these winds we're feeling right now, the trade winds, yeah. shuts down completely during El Nino events. And so the ocean, which is normally bringing up this cool water along the equator, that stops, and this place gets extremely warm.
figure out if human activity is making El Nino worse now, Kim first had to figure out how bad they used to be. She needed a window into this island's past, something that would allow her to look at climate here going back thousands of years. She began her search underwater in the coral reefs. The corals, they grow very fast and very reliably. And as they grow, they are recording environmental information into their skeleton. And they create this wonderful year by year by year archive. So if you're using coral as a thermometer into the past. That's correct. Kim takes me below the surface to show me how it works. Coral adds layers each year in much the same way a tree adds rings. By closely examining those layers, Kim hoped to literally see El Nino events that took place in the past. But taking a look deep inside living coral requires much more than a microscope. A month after Sandy, there's still a long way to go before Staten Island is back on its feet. No single event has ever consumed more of Congressman Michael Grimm's time. We're going to break up into two groups. One of the uh, groups has two locations uh, with two elderly women that, but for this help, they probably wouldn't know what they're going to do. The fact that it's a month later and they still haven't cleaned out speaks volumes in and of itself. I see it in their eyes that a lot of people are losing hope. A lot of people are thinking that they're not going to get through this. Then they're starting to feel the people forgetting about them, that they're not forgotten. Okay, your hands are freezing. Yeah, it's, it's cold. It's cold. It's a little while. OK. And it's going to be years, and I know that. And it's hard. And uh, so we just want to make sure they understand they're not alone, they're not forgotten. His office is overwhelmed with calls from storm victims. If you want, I can help walk you through the process. My staff has been unbelievable. I mean, they've been on the phone. A lot of my staff live in these neighborhoods. Are you still living on Bard? What needs to be done here? It's the scope of that is tremendous. In fact, Sandy is turning out to be one of the most destructive storms in history. And it's leading to a big battle in Congress over how much to spend on the recovery. I think we're at Grimm is teaming up with Republicans and Democrats from the affected states to get billions of dollars in aid for Sandy victims like Pat Trash. We're not that much different. Republican, Democrat, Jersey, New York. When your people are hurting, we all want to do the best we can for our community and ultimately for our country. Pat's home was completely washed away by the storm. For now, she's staying in temporary housing provided by her church. I'm not used to this, being by myself. Seems like it was yesterday. I still have nightmares. There's not a day that goes by that I don't relive that last half hour with my family. Our last dinner together. I relive that whole experience with the water coming up over us in the house. How we got pushed out of the wall when I lost her. My husband was always there for Angela. Now he's gone. It's very hard. She touched so many lives. If Angela Dresch had survived, this is the high school she would have attended. So all of you guys were here during Sandy, right? Yes. It was very scary. My house was shaking. We stayed upstairs on the second floor the whole night. I live in Great Kills, and the harbor was completely destroyed. There were boats in houses, and it was just, it was absolutely insane. Actually, went to With all the talk about climate change following the storm, these students have some questions. Two climate scientists, Dr. Radley Horton and Dr. Heidi Cullen, both Columbia University PhDs, offered to help. Just by show of hands, how many of you guys believe that global warming is actually real, the temperatures are increasing. So, well, unanimous agreement that temperatures are rising. How many of you think that it's our fault? Okay, so we got some questions. Gabriella, right? 
where do you kind of think it, it's not us? I know that we contribute because we have been burning fossil fuels, but I don't think that we're doing it enough so that we're causing climate change. Like the earth, I feel like naturally does it. Then the earth has to go through its cycles. I, I still don't, I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Natalie, what do you, what do you tell Gabriella when she says that she doesn't believe you? <laughs> I tell her she's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, cause I don't know. I feel like since the industrial revolution, fossil fuels have been using at an extreme rate, like cars, heat. Mm -hmm. I think humans definitely play a major role in well, you know, and it was fascinating because there were scientists who kind of made this connection that carbon dioxide was this thermostat, right? You crank up carbon dioxide, you crank up temperature, you crank down carbon dioxide, you crank down the temperature. And I think for me as a scientist, what really pushed me over the edge was when I began to understand you can actually chemically fingerprint the CO2 in the atmosphere to different sources. Multiple lines of evidence do allow us to track it back to fossil fuel burning. And one out of every four carbon dioxide molecules in the atmosphere today was put there by us. But I don't think that us, we are contributing to it so much that it, we're causing Sandy and I don't, I don't believe that. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I'm kind of agreeing with Gabriella on that point, but I don't know, I feel like human impact maybe played a role in that, but also the, the high tide with the moon definitely it's made the severity of the storm much worse. That's a great thing to talk about. What aspects can we attribute to human activity um, and, and what can't we? There are all these different elements that had to come together to make this terrible storm surge, but one of them was an extra foot of sea level that we had had over the last century, uh, largely as a result of climate change. What seems like a little bit, one foot, can actually have a huge impact on how frequently we get extreme events. It's like, if you think of a basketball analogy, it's the equivalent of like raising the floor of a basketball court by one foot without changing the height of the rims at all. You're just gonna get that many more slam dunks in the form of, of coastal flooding. And it did make Sandy worse, right? I mean, there were some areas where that extra foot absolutely made a difference. Mm -hmm. A detailed analysis by the research organization Climate Central shows how global warming made more homes vulnerable to a storm like Sandy. Without sea level rise, flooding from Sandy would have reached about eight feet above high tide. When you factor in that extra foot of sea level, most of which is due to climate change, the differences seem small at first. A block here, a few houses there, but over miles of densely populated coast, it adds up. In New York City alone, climate change put the homes of some 75,000 additional people in the path of the storm surge. And it's only going to get worse. Scientists say that by the end of the century, some parts of the coast could see sandy level storm surges every single year. We're about to use this 100 pound drill to collect coral samples. Kim started studying these reefs 17 years ago to test a theory that by analyzing this coral, she could measure the severity of past El Ninos and find out if they're getting worse. But just moving around down here is a challenge, let alone trying to operate the kind of equipment that really belongs on a construction site. So that's what we're gonna drill into. This is our first candidate. At first, everything seems to be going wrong. Hoses are getting caught, ropes become tangled. Too much tension on the arch line. Then the drill breaks down, and Kim has to make repairs on the spot. Guys, can you check the water on top side and see that it's not sucking air? We're getting air out of the drill down here, over. But despite all the hurdles, she's getting the job done. When the drilling starts, the water's suddenly clouded with what looks like mucus. Kim says it's actually living coral tissue. So after we're done drilling, Kim will carefully plug up the holes left behind so the coral can grow back. So this goes pretty amazing. You can see 
all the banding in this sport, catching back year by year. Looks like 15 or so years. It's a time machine. Actually, it's more like a time capsule. One that can only be opened through careful analysis back in Kim's lab at Georgia Tech. Each layer of coral contains a wealth of information about one year of climate. Kim is most interested in temperature, because high ocean temperatures are a signature of El Nino at Christmas Island. It turns out that coral is an incredibly accurate thermometer. The temperature data stored in the coral lines up with known temperature records almost exactly. But Kim says if we're lucky, we might be able to see something without all that fancy equipment. Put it here. All right. Look at that. That's a pretty good stash, huh? Pretty good haul. This is the first core we drilled. Right. And um, this is probably about 50, I would say 50 years is a reasonable guess. So this right here yeah. is where the coral essentially stopped growing. Right and there, that yes, band. It created this, this massive disturbance in this core where you can see a clear, what we call a discontinuity. And this was the 1997-1998 El Nino event when this place got really, really too hot for corals for about six months. Kim tells me it was the worst El Nino on record, and it's eerie to see it frozen in time. El Nino is being blamed for heavy rains of biblical proportions. In Northern California, thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. Wild with nearly 90 deaths so far. Heavy winds caused this helicopter crash in Tennessee that killed three people. It spread destruction around the world, flooding in Kenya, mudslides in Ecuador and Peru, droughts and fires in Indonesia. The people who live in these little shanty towns have lost everything. In the end, it cost an estimated $33 billion in damage. The death and damage, the rubble, mud, and flood are still mounting. And killed more than 20,000 people. It hit central Florida and killed at least 26 people. 400 people have been killed. 2,000 deaths have been blamed on the flooding. Rescue workers were still finding bodies today. And here's the million dollar question. Is an event like this entirely natural? Or are El Nino's getting worse because of our impact on the climate? To find out, Kim needed much older coral. The samples she drilled underwater only go back 40 or 50 years. And she needed to go back thousands of years. Problems seemed insurmountable. But after more than a decade of searching, Kim finally found a solution. We all know that human activities are changing the atmosphere in unexpected and in unprecedented ways. This is George H.W. Bush speaking to a global gathering of climate scientists in 1990. Today, it seems unimaginable that a Republican president would sound the alarm on global warming. The stakes here are very high. But he was just continuing a long tradition of Republican environmentalism. It was Richard Nixon who created the EPA and signed the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. Preservation of our environment is not a liberal or conservative challenge. It's common sense. Even Ronald Reagan took action to protect the ozone layer. In the early 2000s, John McCain fought for a cap and trade bill designed to curb CO2 emissions the first national legislation of its kind. Mr. President, that's the Arctic Sea. That's the Arctic Sea, and you look at the red line, the boundary of it in 1979. Look at it now. You can believe me or your lion eyes. And in 2008, when McCain was the party's nominee for president, addressing climate change was part of the official Republican platform. There seemed to be a growing consensus between Democrats and Republicans on the issue. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. And it seemed like Washington was taking action. A climate change bill actually passed the House in 2009. But the energy sector, led by fossil fuel companies, spent half a billion dollars in lobbying and campaign contributions to fight it. Drill all of America's oil, mine all of America's coal. 
By the time it reached the Senate, not even John McCain would support it. Soon, Gingrich flip-flopped. Well, that's probably the dumbest single thing I've done in recent years. <laughs> <laughs> and the Tea Party, with lots of oil and gas money behind it, helped elect people like Michael Grimm. I personally am one of the guys that has been skeptical of global warming from the beginning. The jury is obviously still out on it. Suddenly, saying you accepted the science on climate change could cost you your seat. Just ask Bob Inglis. A conservative who says that climate change is real? Now that is an unusual zoo animal, right? A six-term congressman from South Carolina, Inglis was the most vocal Republican member of Congress calling for action on climate change. A lot of people are elected based on coal money, on oil money. Uh, I mean, how do you break through that if... Well, it's tough. Uh, it's real tough. But, I mean, it, we, we just can't keep this up. In 2010, he lost his seat to a Tea Party candidate in the Republican primary. I had done some things that were clearly uh, problems politically. But the most enduring here is he was just saying that climate change is real. And let's do something about it. Since leaving Congress, Inglis is traveling the country, pitching a conservative solution to climate change. It would tax companies that emit CO2, but give a matching tax cut to other companies and American households. And he's trying to convince Republicans that despite what happened to him, they can't keep denying reality forever. The worst thing in the world is not losing an election. The worst thing in the world is losing your soul. When you know there are things you believe in and you're not willing to stand for them. Michael Grimm is exactly the kind of Republican Inglis is trying to reach. And Grimm agreed to sit down with him. But will it make a difference? I was from maybe the reddest district in the reddest state. 93 American Conservative Union rating, 100% Christian Coalition, 100% National Right to Life, A with the NRA. So pretty conservative guy, right? When I was first in Congress, I totally poo-pooed climate change. I said it was nonsense. Al Gore's imagination. I had a great press conference one time where I absolutely tore Al Gore apart. But then my kids were growing up. My oldest, who just turned 18 when I was running again in 2004, okay. said, uh, I'll vote for you, Dad, but you're going to clean up your act on the environment. Um, problem for me was his four sisters agreed uh, and his mother. And so okay. I had this new constituency that could change the locks on the doors. Well, um, that's and so I, the most important constituency. Yeah, I had to <laughs> respond to this constituency, you know? So that was part of it for me. And then the other was I got on the Science Committee when I got back to Congress, went to the South Pole, saw the ice core drillings, saw the evidence. What do you think it is that we Republicans have gotten in this spot of basically distrusting the scientists, you know? I'm, um, not, I'm not so sure that it's distrusting the scientists what Republicans are afraid of is if we give more credence to climate change, that it's going to be, you know, the, 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 the call, the, the, the cry for more rules, more regulations. Yeah, I agree completely. We're trying to change the conversation. We want to change it away from the apocalyptic visions that uh, rightly signal conservatives that here it comes, a big old water regulations and a tax increase. We want to change it to a conversation about reasonable risk avoidance. You know, um, 98 doctors tell you to treat your son this way. Two say no this other. It's not conservative to go with two. Um, and that's really sort of where we are in climate science, right? We've got about 98 doctors that say it's for real and it's human cause. And we got two say no, it's not. It's sort of an odd place I believe for us as Republicans to be that we listen to the two. I mean, we actually not even listen. We seek out the two. We call them to hearings. We want to hear from them, the two. Right. Of course, in a way, I'm, 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 I'm the worst person to try to convince you because, I mean, look what happened to me, right? Right. Um, yeah. in, is, uh, That's so, the politics, though. Yeah. If Republicans start coming out and 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 let's say that, that, that they, they did agree with the science and they were, were bold enough and the political courage that you had, if they believed it, to go forward, and then they lose, well, how many other are gonna, uh, uh, they're not all lemmings, okay? They're not gonna uh. just go right off that cliff. So the, the political constraints, I think, are a lot bigger than most people would, would, would understand, yeah. and they're very real. But you're also in a place that's had a different experience. You've had people that have been inundated 
with the storm surge that some of them may have this sense of need of addressing a problem. Um, that may affect, that may give you some room to move that others don't have. Kim spent years looking for the biggest and oldest coral she could find. She was trying to trace the history of El Nino back thousands of years, but she couldn't find corals older than 60 years. Then she realized the solution was right under her feet. We were over here scouting for bigger corals one day to survey the rest of the island, and we just walked up to this beach, and I just looked left, and I looked right, and I just said, click, click, wow, this is a game changer. All these fragments of fossilized coral washed up onto this beach over millennia. There's more corals here right now than are probably growing on the reef today. And how old are some of these blocks that would have been brought up here? I mean, They're roughly. Up to, up to 6,000 years old. 6,000 years it's old. It's a grab bag of goodies. looking for something pretty special. I have to find a pretty special piece and I'll show you okay. what we're looking for. These fossils are from dozens of different species of coral, and we're looking for just one, the same type we drilled, so Kim can make an apples to apples comparison. Talk about it's, a little, it's a little rare, but you'll get the hang of it. This is not what you want. No, 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 no. Plates, plates, no, no plates. No plates. No plates. Oh, how about this? That looks cool. No, no, Come that's on, you're doing not, great no, science with this. No. Oh, here's one. Got it. Here's one. All right, now, I told you, I told you. This is the same species that we drilled underwater the other day, believe oh. it or not. How do you know how old this piece actually is? Well, right now, I have no idea. This could be 50 years old. This could be 6,000 years old. So we have to take them all back and yeah. we date them. We use a very fast screening dating method, radiocarbon dating method to date them. Then you can tell me how warm the ocean was on a particular year 4,000 years ago. That's right. And I That's can tell fantastic. you how That's many El Nino events happened in this section. It really is. And if I have enough of these, I can give you a very accurate estimate of climate during that time. Around this ocean. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. Each coral sample is a piece of a giant jigsaw puzzle. And they'll be shipped back to the United States where they're dated and put in order by age to create a continuous record of ocean temperature going back thousands of years. We're throwing a lot of samples and a lot of data at this question. What happened to climate at Christmas Island in the recent past? And we're getting a lot of samples telling us their story. And that story is a frightening one. Hey, uh, Bob here. Hey, Bob, I'm here. Yeah, so the next item on the agenda is, is about the next trip to DC, and you know, we really need to discuss this, because that's <laughs> coming up on Monday. Florida Senator Marco Rubio is a rising star in the Republican Party. He's also a climate change denier. But a few years ago, he wasn't. And Bob Inglis wants to convince him to come back around. I have no idea what his position is on this, but I'd like to talk to him about it. Yeah. So, um, what, what do you what do you think? Should uh, the, the one argument is to wait until there might be an opportunity with Senator Rubio. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know. 
Yeah. No, I think that's right. I think he's, he's clearly occupied with other stuff. So, um... The, the film, the film flying spot. If you lose in politics, it's sort of like everybody knows. And so, so sort of a, a pulling away, you know, sort of like, a, you know, avoid him. And it's continuing. And, you know, it hurts because people think that I've sort of gone to the other side, that I've crossed to the other tribe. Um, it's pretty painful. It, it continues to be. You know, there's sort of a sense that uh, you can't go home. the other way. All right. So, can we do it? Yeah, sorry. Not a I... problem. Today, Michael Grimm plans to surprise Pat Dresch. He's been helping her get a new home, but the process is dragging on. So in the meantime, he's replacing a family heirloom lost in the storm, an American flag commemorating her father's service in World War II. We obviously can't give the exact flag, but this flag was flown over the Capitol. Oh my God. Okay, in Washington, D.C. Oh this was done um, oh on behalf of your dad, so it is his flag. Okay. I, I actually folded it myself, being in the Marine Corps. I've, I've learned how to fold the flag, <laughs> but it's been a while, so it's not folded exactly. I'm going to refold it before I put it in. His service and his dedication will always be remembered. And I just want you to know. Thank you. Oh. You okay. back in home, back home. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what you're gonna have, and I'm going, I'm coming over for dinner. <laughs> Anytime. Just... I can't wait. I can't wait to hear the words. He has the keys. Stop moving in. That's my dream to hear those words. Hey, well, how's the vote schedule look? Michael Grimm has been working feverishly to round up votes for a $60 billion relief package for Sandy victims. But under pressure from the Tea Party, the same movement that helped get Grimm elected, the bill is suddenly abandoned. The $60 billion aid package, without any explanation whatsoever, House Speaker John Boehner decided not to vote on before the 112th Congress ended. The decision occasioned a rare, full-scale, full-spectrum mutiny from New Jersey and New York Republicans. I don't agree with his call to delay this, to delay the vote. I don't. Uh, I don't support it at all. I think it was the wrong call. This is not what, this delay is not what we wanted. It is absolutely inexcusable. It means Pat Dresch and thousands of other storm victims will have to wait even longer to start rebuilding their communities and their lives. David. David. Good. Good. Slow it up. Slow it up, Jimmy. Hey, 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 Right, do it again. When that vote didn't happen, I got to tell you, I, I was a little broken. It's very, very personal for me to deliver on the, on the relief package. And it is a fight. Every day I go to work, I'm fighting with someone, whether it's. The, the mayor's office, or whether it's the administration in Washington, or whether it's sometimes my own party. But it's always a fight. After years of trekking back and forth between Christmas Island and her lab in Atlanta, Kim's research on coral is yielding clues about human impact on El Niños. It suggests that in the 20th century, El Niños are as much as 20% more severe than in the previous 7,000 years. In the past few decades, the trend is especially clear. There's something different about these 30, 40 years in the recent past. Larger events, more frequent events in the last 30, 40 years. Now the big question then is, why? The inference in uncovering yeah. an unprecedented 
behavior and climate in the last 30, 40 years, yeah. as opposed to the natural variations the last 6,000. The strong inference yeah. is that that's causally linked and that that's related to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Sure. Carbon dioxide that's been on the rise as a result of human activity. And it turns out that the very thing Kim is studying, climate change, is threatening the very place where she's conducting her research. This coral island is slowly falling victim to the rising seas. So how long before the rest of Christmas Island, you know, the bits with the trees on, end up looking like this? Well, I mean, you want my educated opinion yeah. about it. Um, I would say about one meter in 100 years. I so would within say the lifetime a, of your grandkids? Yeah, that most of Christmas will be having serious problems with sea level rise. It's a disappearing country. It hurts my heart being in love with this place. It hurts my heart. Two months after Superstorm Sandy, Congress has taken the first step to give financial help to the many families and businesses in the storm zone that are still suffering. Today, Congress gave the okay after delays and politics slowed down emergency aid. As the months dragged on, Michael Grimm continued to help Pat Trash through the process of getting a new house. We still haven't done enough, and there's a lot to do, so that, that has not been lost. But at the same time, we do have to reflect on monumental steps forward. And, and this, is a, this is a big step forward. The city, too, can start accepting applications to get people's lives back together, and that's what really this is about. But for Pat, it would still be months before she finally had a place she could call home. It's now August, 10 months since Superstorm Sandy slammed into the eastern seaboard. It affected millions, and some people's lives were changed forever. But one of the most surprising things is how it changed Michael Grimm. Last time you and I spoke, you said the jury was still out on, yep. on the climate science. Do you still feel that way? You know, after speaking with Bob Inglis, it, it made me do my own research. You know, I looked at some of the stuff that, that he sent over, my staff looked at. But the vast majority of respected scientists uh, say, you know, that it's conclusive. The evidence is clear. So I don't think the jury is out. The basic story of we're putting carbon in the atmosphere, the planet's getting warmer, that's going to make the sea levels rise. Like, the basic story of that, you're, you, you pretty much agree with, right? Sure. I mean, there's no question that, um, you know, the oceans have risen, right? And the climate change part is, is a real part of it. The problem that we're going to have right now, there's no oxygen left in the room in Washington right now for another big debate. That's the reality. You know, between immigration but, and tax reform. I don't disagree, but let, let me not, ask you. It's just not going to take front stage. But I want to, there's a study coming out, because this, this, this gets a precise point. If you take just the amount of sea level rise and you factor it into what's, what the sandy storm surge was, this study says you got about 25 square miles of flooding that wouldn't have happened. So my question to you is, if in three years from now there's another one of these storms that takes out another 70,000 homes, it's like, at what point does this become the priority? Washington is not real life. You see, you're talking the substance and the science. Right. And my, my point to you is right. irrelevant. Right, right. Irrelevant. You have to first get them to the table to say, let's work together. So then what's your role in getting them to do that? If you told me there's too much other stuff going on in Washington right now, we can't get Sandy relief, you would say, sorry, excuse my language, bullshit. Right. And what I'm saying to you is, th the people that live on this island are going to get, there's going to be more storms, and they're going to be worse unless we get our act together. I mean, can you, literally, can you sit down with fellow Republicans and say, look, come to my district. We had water that in places it shouldn't have been. Yes, but not what everyone is saying, immigration, taxes, and members of Congress don't want to talk about anything else. And 20 years from now, you and I are going to have a conversation where we look back. I, I really believe this. And it's like, what do you, what do you think about when you think about that conversation 20 years from now about where you were, where your personal voice was of leadership? What I'm telling you is it's, it's, it's much bigger than me. I don't think the, that humans in America, uh, Americans, have the will to do it. But we're, that's a terribly depressing statement. It may be, but it's true. But we had the will to settle the frontier. We had the will to land on the moon. We had if you think my generation or the generation after me has that, I think you're living in fantasy land. They don't. They don't. 
I wonder how you are going to look back at yourself as a member of the United States Congress if history unfolds in the way that I think the science says it does and makes these distinctions between the people that actually had the, had the fortitude to stand up and say the unpopular thing and those who didn't. History judges those people incredibly harshly. It puts them in two categories. It puts them in the categories of people that met the biggest challenge in their time and people who didn't. You know, politicians don't feel any support underneath them. They, they don't lead. The thing that encourages me is I know that they, uh, a good number, know better. God bless, stay healthy. All right, be well, it's good to see you. They know that we've really got to pay attention to the science. <laughs> oh. Experience is a very effective, but often harsh teacher. Well, we are being taught now about climate change. The question is whether that can be coupled with the hope that there's something that can be done.